Well, today we wrap up our sermon series, Guardrails. We have been walking through the Ten Commandments. We've been looking at each one of the Ten Commandments, and we've been looking at them and seeing how they apply to our lives. Now, make no mistake about it, the Ten Commandments are not the way to get to heaven. So we hope we've conveyed that. The, the only way to get to heaven is through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the life change that we talk about. Your life is changed forever when you meet Jesus. However, what are the Ten Commandments for? Well, if the Ten Commandments aren't the way that we get to heaven, why do we need to follow them? And the reality is they function as guardrails. God has provided us with the Ten Commandments now, today, so that we don't crash our lives. How many of us have messed up before? As we've looked at the Ten Commandments, how many of you have broken one or two or five or ten, right? We have, we're all sinners. We know that we can't get to heaven because we've all violated every one of those Ten Commandments, but we can get to heaven through beginning a life-changing relationship with Jesus. If you've been here over the last few weeks and you've heard us say that, I want you to know that at the end of tonight's message, I want to, to lead you to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've been attending for a while and you've not yet met Christ as your Savior, you haven't experienced that life change, I'm going to give you an opportunity to tonight at the close of our service. So now I hope you've taken the time to learn the Ten Commandments. Has anybody taken the time to learn the Ten all right, I'm not going to call on you. All right, it's been refreshing for me. I, I grew up uh, Catholic, and so we had to memorize the Ten Commandments. Of course, uh, I went through fourth grade in Catholic school. We had to memorize the Ten Commandments, uh, but it's been refreshing for me. And honestly, it has been a gut-checking season for me as we've looked at the Ten Commandments. Number one is, I am the Lord your God who rescued you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven images. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. And do not covet is our final commandment that we have tonight. So that's what we're looking at. Exodus 20, 17. If you uh, don't have a Bible, if you'll reach to the bi underneath the seat in front of you grabbing the Bible, uh, you can use that Bible as a guide tonight. Exodus 20, verse 17, it's on page 72. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, as I mentioned, I grew up Catholic I always thought that this was the dirty commandment. Anybody familiar with the King James Version? If you're familiar with the King James translation, you'll understand why I thought this was the dirty commandment. I didn't think this had anything to do. I thought this actually had to do with adultery. And I'll explain to you. And the King James Version says this, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. I thought it was the dirty verse. I thought we were talking about adultery in this, this uh, verse. So I thought, well, why is God repeating himself? He already said, don't commit adultery. So welcome to my middle school brain. Out of, the, out of all Ten Commandments, this one has hit me the hardest. Uh, I find that this is the one that I'm guilty of the most. Uh, this, this Ten Commandment, this final commandment is one that uh, I find that I wrestle with the most. Today I want to share four statements about this, this commandment that I hope will ring true for you. And I hope that you'll experience life change as a result of tonight's message. So the first statement I want to share with you is that this last commandment points backward and forward. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by that. It points backwards and it points forward. Forward. As we glance back over those Ten Commandments, as I just went through them, the first nine commandments are all dealing with something that is measurable. They're all dealing with a measurable action. They're all dealing with something that can be seen. Uh, the lying, stealing, murder, keeping the Sabbath, idolatry, having other gods, taking God's name in vain. All of those commandments are, uh, are, can be seen. But this commandment, 
is the only of the Ten Commandments that deals in the context and the culture where, in which it was given that deals with the heart, the desire of the heart. God placed this commandment at the end of all the rest to point backwards to the rest of the commandments as well. And it, this commandment also explains why we choose to break the commandments. See, the reason why we choose to break each and every one of the commandments has to do with our want to. It has to do with our heart. See, we, well, the reason why we steal is we want to steal. The reason why you lie, or I lie, or we lie, is because you want to lie. The reason why we commit adultery, we want to. The reason why we dishonor our parents, we want to. The reason why we don't take a Sabbath rest, we want to. See, the reason why we commit all those sins, the reason why we break the Ten Commandments, is because there's something wrong and broken with our hearts that we automatically rebel against what God wants for us. This Ten Commandment points us backward to the rest. It's as though God placed it strategically at the end and said, after all these commandments, don't even think about doing those things. How many of you have said that to your child before? Right? Don't even think about it. You know, this is what I don't want you to do, and in case you want to do it, don't think about doing it. Right? That's what God is saying here at the end. He, he's addressing our hearts. He's addressing our thought life. The Hebrew word translated as covet means to indulge in thoughts that lead to sin. That's what it means to covet. It's to indulge in thoughts that lead to sin. This final commandment is one of the earliest Old Testament insights into the fact that it is the inner life of man. It is the inner life of our, us as human beings, the inner desires, the inner thoughts that determine our legacy, what we leave behind. It's our inner thoughts that determine what we leave behind. This 10th commandment climbs into the secret place of our heart that nobody else can see. See, this 10th this commandment climbs into our minds. It climbs into our spirits. And it challenges us deep inside that no one else around us is able to see. That alone place, that private place between God and between us. God knows our thoughts. See, God's not only concerned about our outward actions, but about the inner desires of our hearts. So the question I have is why? Why is God concerned about our hearts, our thoughts so much? I mean, if God was only, I mean, if we never murder, isn't that enough for God? If, if we never steal, isn't that enough for God? Why does God care about what I'm thinking on the inside? If I, not, if I don't do that simple action that I'm thinking about doing. Well, maybe an illustration would be helpful. Suppose your child or your son or your daughter or whoever took a rock and went out to your new car and took that rock and just scratched up and down the side of the vehicle. How many of you would not be happy? Okay, we would not be happy. Then imagine what you would say if you sat down with your child and you're, obviously you're upset and you say, why did you do it? And they say, because I wanted to. See, you can take all the rocks out of your yard away from the child, but you can't change your child's heart. See, you, you might punish your child, but you're still going to be more troubled at the fact that your child wanted to do it. He wanted to have this destructive behavior. In essence, that is precisely what coveting is. See, I covet when I indulge in thoughts that lead to sin. God is not only concerned about our actions, but the thoughts we think of as well. Now, I want to camp out on this idea of our thought life. Okay, did you know that researchers have, have told us, because they've studied this, they've studied it a lot longer than I have, that the average human thinks about 50,000 thoughts a day. Roughly 50,000 thoughts a day run through our minds every single day now raise your hand if you have serious doubts that some people think that much <laughs> right not if your spouse doesn't think that much well he here's another statistic for you of those 50,000 thoughts researchers have said that 70 to 80 percent of those 50,000 thoughts are negative 
So when we think, as we often do, we think all the time, 70 to 80% of 50,000 thoughts are negative. They're critical. That means on a good day, we, all of us, have 35 to 40,000 negative thoughts every single day. Isn't that mind-blowing? I mean, that's, that's, that should be troubling for us. And if we, if we were really to begin to think about it, we would think, you know what? I think that's right because we have negative thoughts about people that we work with. We have negative thoughts about our neighbors. We have negative thoughts about the driver in front of us. We have negative thoughts about family, about spouse, about our uh, teachers, about our future. We have negative thoughts about ourselves. We have negative thoughts about our past. We have negative thoughts sometimes about our church or about our life groups or about one another. Uh, we have negative thoughts about spam callers that call and try to sell us more insurance on our vehicles. Uh, we have negative thoughts about our past and on our future and so on and so on and so on. Our thoughts matter to God. Our want to matters to God. Our desires matter to God. So gut check, let's be honest with ourselves and honest with one another. Raise your hand if you had a negative thought. This is, this is risky. Raise your hand if you had a negative thought about your spouse this week. Raise your hand if you lied and didn't raise your hand. <laughs> raise your hand if you had a negative thought about your family this week. It could be family, extended family. Raise your hand if you had some negative thoughts about the construction going on in Lake Havasu this week, right? I actually put a little car bra on the front of my car because I was getting hit with rocks all the time. Yes, we, we have negative thoughts. And we have a lot of negative thoughts. In fact, according to what research says, we think more negatively than we do positively. Now, if they are correct, with 40,000 negative thoughts going through each and every one of us this week, what does that corporately represent here today? Right, so multiply this, multiply this out by the, the size of the crowd that's here. How many negative thoughts were brought into this room tonight? How, how many negative thoughts are sitting up and down the aisles where we're sitting? Boy, a lot, right? So I don't know what the math would be, but if there was, uh, you know, maybe we've wrestled with over 300,000 negative thoughts this past week that we've all brought together in this room. The point about all these negative thoughts is this. Our thought life is the foundation for our actions. And if we have 35 to 40,000 negative thoughts that run through our head every day, eventually those negative thoughts are going to create in our hearts a lack of contentment. And here's what that means. When I am not content, I will be tempted to covet. See, when I'm wrestling with negativity, when I'm wrestling with, with negative thoughts, when I'm wrestling with uh, uh, criticism that I might have towards other people, though I may never say it, but if I have it in my heart, I'm going to be stirring up a discontentment in my heart. And when I am not content, I will be tempted to covet. I'll want what other people have. I'll want their popularity. I'll want their house. I'll want their vehicles. I'll want their families. I'll want their wife. What about you? What do you wrestle with when you are not content? What, what surfaces in your heart? What surfaces in your mind? Do you want another's family? Do you want their spouse? Do you want their children? Do you think that other people have it all together and you're the only one that's wrestling through life? If you do, it's because you're not content. If you're not content, if you're not content, there is great hope in this message because we're all forgiven by God. We, we've all, we all can experience his grace. We all can experience second chances and third chances and fourth chances. If we look at the thoughts, if we look at our, the negative thoughts that we wrestle with, we don't have to stay the same way we were. We don't have to. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who has compassion on us. We have a God who wants us to not covet 
and he's given us a very simple, very incredible way that our entire thoughts can be transformed and changed. Raise your hand if you believe that God is able to change the way you think. Yeah. See, God can change the way you think. I can't change the way you think. I can't convince you of anything. I can't convince you that Jesus is Lord. I can't convince you that I'm actually wearing a blue shirt. I, I am incapable of convincing you of any truth, but God is capable of convincing you. God is capable of changing your mind. Romans 12, 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. What a beautiful promise of scripture that we have. See, God can actually transform you into a new person. That's life change by, not by you obeying all Ten Commandments, but by changing the way you think, changing your want to, changing your desire, changing your perception, changing the uh, negative to positive. God is able to transform your thoughts. How do we know that? It says it right here in God's word. And many of us have experienced that transformation. Many of us have experienced God giving us hope when we were once dark and confused. Many of us have experienced that light that God brings. In the original language, the word that Paul used for the phrase changing the way you think means a renewal, a renovation, a complete change for the better. How many of you have experienced some type of renovation on your house before? Raise your hand if you've experienced some type of renovation. What? You didn't change it to make it worse, did you? You didn't say, hey, you know what? I could really use this door to be a little bit narrower, right? I'd like for my cabinets to be a little bit more inconvenience, right? You didn't say that. When God talks about changing the way we think, when God talks about renovating us, he is talking about changing us for the better. Changing the way we think, transforming us into a new person. God can change the way you think. You say, there is no way. If you knew what I've done, if you knew my past, if you know the mistakes that I've made and what I've done, there's no way that God can change me. You know what? He can. He's done it for the centuries before us. He's going to do it the centuries after us unless Jesus comes back. He changes us. He knows we're incapable of keeping Ten Commandments. He knows that we're all going to be guilty of sinning and breaking God's law. He knows, and therefore, he provided a way to change us. He provided a way to transform us. Now, before we can think about changing our lives, we must ask God to change the way we think. And if God doesn't change our minds, then we're right back in the same boat where we were before. So let's us understand together this simple truth that the cure for coveting is contentment. The cure for coveting is contentment. It's the cure. It's the contentment. Okay, now the Apostle Paul was a guy that followed Jesus. He wasn't always a follower of Jesus, but he became a follower of Jesus and he went out on mission trips telling people about Jesus. And as he went, as he told people about Jesus, as he talked with people, he had been beaten, he had been robbed, he was stoned, he was left for dead, he was hungry, he was homeless, he was abandoned, he was shipwrecked. He faced challenges as he shared the gospel. He faced challenges as he lived for Jesus because he has trained his mind to be content. Now, we would look at all the situations that Paul experienced, whether it be homelessness, whether it be hungry, whether it be abandonment, whether it be beaten and stoned and robbed. We would look at all those and say there's no way that a man could be content and experience those things. Yet every one of the troubles and every one of the challenges that Paul had, every one that he faced, he had a spirit of contentment about him, but he didn't have it initially. Philippians 4, 11, Paul writes this. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I know, uh, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to, I know how to abound. 
in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing, uh, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul used the word, I have learned. As a follower of Jesus, Paul wasn't always content. But he had to learn that secret of being content. He had to learn, he had to condition his mind. And who conditioned his mind? It was God who changed the way he thought. Contentment is a learned attitude. See, if we've had enough of the negative thoughts racing through our minds, if we've had enough of negativity and negative thoughts, we must ask our great God to help us learn to be content. You face troubles, you face hardships, we all do. Don't they get worse when we have a bad attitude, when we go through difficult situations? I mean, we'd all agree that we've seen other people, of course not ourselves, but when they, when they walk through difficult times and their attitude just stinks, boy, it can be really hard for them. I have a confession to make. God is, re everyone sits up when I say I have a confession to make. Everyone's like, that's it? <laughs> Leaning in. God is reconditioning my heart in this area. God is making me new in this area of coveting. As I've walked through the Ten Commandments and as I've studied them, man, I just keep looking back and saying, God, I am just a complete sinner. Because I always want to be honest and I always want to be transparent as I share. When I was a child, I coveted others' homes, other families, other siblings, other moms, other dads, other athletic, others' athletic abilities, others' grades. I coveted everything. Uh, I had grown to such a dark place in my heart because of the abuse that I experienced as a kid that ed, anything that I had, any possession, it wasn't as good as anybody else. My clothes weren't as good as what other people had. Our family house wasn't as good or as nice as what other people had. Everything that I thought I owned wasn't as good as what other people had. I coveted everything. The family car was worse than anybody else. My baseball glove was worse than what anybody else had. My baseball bat was worse than what anybody else had. I did not have what others had. I coveted everything. And then I became a follower of Jesus in 1991. I knelt down and I told Jesus I was tired of my sin. And I asked him to forgive me and cleanse me. And I, I said, would you enter into my life and change me into the person that you want me to be? Would you forgive me? And thank you for forgiving me. And in that moment, that instant, I met Jesus. I began my relationship with Jesus. But as a pastor now, uh, since uh, that was in 1991, and now what a year is it, 2019? Man, I, I've looked back over my life as I've been studying and preparing for this message and saying, oh God, I'm guilty of coveting. I'm still, as a pastor, guilty of coveting. I thought the old way of life was behind me, and it's not. I allowed coveting to creep into my heart as a pastor. I wanted to have the nice big office like I'd seen other senior pastors have. I wanted to have the nice big automobile that other senior pastors had. You know, I wanted to have the nice house that I'd seen other senior pastors had. I wanted to have the prestige that other senior pastors had. I wanted to say the right thing. I wanted to say, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You know, I wanted to say, God bless you. I, I wanted to say the right words. I lied to myself. I deceived myself because I was looking at all these other things that pastors did and that pastors had, and I thought that's how I'm supposed to be instead of just being myself and being content with my character, being content with who God has created me to be, being content with my possessions and goods and saying that's all God wants me to be is to be content and to be thankful. And that's just over the past few years that I've realized that. That's just over the past few years that I've, I've realized that in my life. Paul tells us that we have the capacity to control our thought life. How does God want to change the way you think? Well, it comes from his word. Philippians 4.8 says this, Paul writes, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right 
and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. We understand that we think negative thoughts, but we don't have to be content with that. We can memorize Philippians 4, 8. We can memorize Psalm 119, 9, and 11, and we can apply God's word to our lives and fix our minds on what is good and what is honorable and what is right. So when we feel that desire creeping in to covet what other people have, when we feel that desire creeping in that other people are better, other people are better off, then we can simply say, God, fix my mind on the truth. Because that is a lie. It's not true. God, fix my mind on truth. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's anything of virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on those things. If you struggle with your want to, I want to lie, I want to steal, I want to murder, if you struggle with that, <laughs> don't come talk to me. If you struggle with thoughts of lust, if you struggle with adultery, if you struggle in your mind, chances are if you don't get control of your thought life, you're going to yield to the temptation that is springing up out of those desires. So God wants you as followers of Jesus to experience genuine life change by allowing him to change the way you think and he changes the way you think through his word. Meditating on what is good, what is right, what is true, what is honorable. And if you say, Pastor, what are those things? I can give you one name of a man that is those things and that's Jesus. Meditating on grace, meditating on forgiveness, fixing your thoughts on Christ and on Jesus and on the life change that he has called for you to experience. Now, I mentioned that this final command points us backwards and it points us forward, forwards. As Jesus entered the scene and as he encountered those uh, Pharisees and Sadducees who were only concerned about the actions of other people, Jesus taught them, no, yes, you should be concerned about the actions, but also the heart as well. And Jesus is the only one who can change your heart, period. Your spouse can't. She's been trying to forever. Your children can't. They've been trying to for a long time. They say things to you like, Daddy, I wish you would stop this behavior. I wish you wouldn't act like this anymore. God is the only one who can change your want to. Are you willing to let him? Are you willing to, to be humble and say, God, would you change the way I think? Would you help me to fix my thoughts on what is pure and right and true? Would you change me? See, that's a, that's, that's a, that's, that's a step I took in 1991. When I gave my life to Jesus, I was saying, Jesus, change me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. God changed my desires. He changed my thoughts when I gave my life to Jesus. The Ten Commandments points us forward to the forgiveness and grace of Jesus. It's impossible for us to keep all 10. It points us to Jesus. And I would be wrong if I didn't strive to point you to Jesus tonight as we wrap up this sermon series on guardrails. We'll never be able to live a sinless life. That's why God gave us Jesus. Have you come to the end of trying to do what's right? Have you come to the end of knowing and acknowledging that you can't keep those commandments? That you are going to fail? You're never going to be able to have a right relationship with God by keeping the Ten Commandments. 
have you come to the point that you have stopped trying? Let me encourage you to stop trying tonight. You can't attend church enough. You can't know enough of God's word. You can't sing enough worship songs. It's only by trusting in Jesus that you can receive eternal life, that your thoughts can be changed, your desires can be changed. And when your desires and your thoughts are changed, since they are the foundation for our actions, then your actions will change as well. Would you allow God to change your thoughts tonight? I invite you tonight to silently in this moment tell God you're tired of trying. Tell him you're ready to trust. You're ready to trust him tonight and you're ready to receive him and experience the life change that he has for you. Let's pray together. God, you are the only one that can change us. You're the only one that can stop our, our thoughts that are negative. You're the only one that can change our actions by changing our thoughts, by changing our hearts, by changing our desires. God, we want to invite you to do that tonight. Maybe there's individuals in here that's been here throughout this sermon series on the guardrails, the Ten Commandments, and they're tired of trying, and they're ready to trust. They're ready to trust in grace instead of works. They're ready to trust in the truth of Jesus instead of the lies that they've been telling themselves. Our prayer, Father, is that you would open up their heart, their mind, and that they would receive the truth of Jesus tonight. I want to invite you as we pray, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, if he's already grabbed the hold of your heart, and if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, if you believe that he paid the penalty for your sins, that he rose from the dead, and that one day he's going to return. If you've become convinced of that over the last few weeks, would you just tell Jesus tonight you believe? That you, you believe. You believe that God loves you. Say, God, I believe you love me. God, I, I'm convinced that Jesus died on the cross for me. Tell him that. And tell him you're ready to experience life change tonight. And tell him your heart is now his. That you belong to him now. And you give him your life. And you receive Jesus as your savior. And tell him, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for the life change. And commit your life to him. Simply by saying, God, I, I want to experience this life change. And, I want to commit to following Jesus now for the rest of my life.